from the WKYT studios in Lexington, this is Kentucky Newsmakers with Bill Bryant. Good morning from WKYT News. Welcome to Kentucky Newsmakers. Hope you're having a nice weekend. Our guest this morning is Central Kentucky Republican Congressman Andy Barr, who is serving his second term. It's been a busy time in Washington and here at home. Congress getting ready for an upcoming August recess. There are some whispers around the Capitol again of a possible another government shutdown. Some Republicans are hoping to tweak some of the automatic sequester cuts to the military. Some Democrats say they won't go along with that unless there are some entitlement cuts also addressed, so Congress will be mulling over that as well. They're talking about the Iran nuclear agreement that President Obama is pushing hard. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled in favor of the Affordable Care Act again, but many Republicans still want it repealed or changed. In Kentucky, deadly flooding this week likely to lead to a request for federal aid after the governor declared a state of emergency. Some politics, the Republican candidate for governor calling for drug testing for those receiving public assistance, where does Congressman Barr stand on that? And he's been busy in recent weeks uh, working on a bill of interest uh, to the horse industry. Sixth District, Congressman Andy Barr, here with us today on Kentucky Newsmakers. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Hello, how are you? Yeah, good. A lot to talk about. But let's start by being mindful of this uh, shooting attack that happened down the road in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Left four U.S. Marines uh, dead. Um, your thoughts on that? Well, our, our thoughts and prayers go, obviously, to the families of the victims and, and to all men and women who serve in armed forces who know that uh, uh, whether they're just recruits or they're heading into uh, the military, that these are dangerous times. And uh, we're reminded of that when, when you see uh, these, um, uh, you know, uh, attacks against our homeland. Um, this appears to be a, 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 a domestic terrorist, a Kuwait-born terrorist uh, who has uh, targeted uh, the military here at home. But it's a dangerous world, and uh, we're certainly mindful of the, the threat environment, which continues to grow uh, all over this world in terms of terrorism. And you have military uh, installations and facilities uh, in the 6th District, of course, the Bluegrass Army Depot, Avon in Lexington, uh, recruiting stations in uh, many areas. Uh, do those places need to be taking uh, some kind of uh, different uh, measures at this point? They do uh, need to be taking uh, precautions, obviously, uh, given uh, the threats that are, that are out there. Uh, I've been impressed in terms of uh, my uh, visits to both uh, the Bluegrass Army Depot down uh, near Richmond and also uh, Avon Bluegrass Station. Um, the security there is, is uh, uh, you know, something that they take seriously, and, and we appreciate that. But we have to remain vigilant. All right, let's talk about this uh, flooding that's just outside of your district, uh, but an issue for the entire state at this point. We've had fatalities. We have know we have hundreds of homes damaged. Uh, will you look favorably upon any uh, request for federal assistance to deal with that? Of course, that's a critical uh, job that we, uh, we fulfill, uh, and uh, we obviously uh, entertain um, any kind of uh, request for assistance in that regard. You know, one of our roles is, is casework and also constituent service, and so if any local official uh, 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 we, we stay in touch with local officials on those uh, matters, and we're obviously uh, willing to weigh in on, on their behalf if there's a FEMA uh, uh, issue and if they, they're uh, deserving of federal assistance. Horse racing has made its way to Congress. <laughs> uh, you and a Democratic congressman are proposing uh, what you're calling the Thoroughbred Horse Racing Integrity Act uh, because, what, the rules are different in, in, in 38 different jurisdictions around the country as to the, how horses are to be treated and tested and so forth? Right. So we have 38 different jurisdictions. Uh, this is obviously a signature industry of, uh, of, our, of our Commonwealth. Uh, and, and I've dedicated my service uh, to uh, promoting the signature industries of our Commonwealth, whether it's coal, auto manufacturing, the bourbon distilling industry, or obviously our, our world-class thoroughbred breeding and uh, racing industry. And uh, I've been doing a lot of listening over the past um, nearly three years to my constituents who, um, who are uh, participants in the thoroughbred industry in central Kentucky and, frankly, all around the country. Uh, and what uh, the, the, the 
the uniform voice of all of the participants is that we we labor under 38 different jurisdictions with different rules in each jurisdiction and um, this um, lack of consistency, this lack of uniformity impairs interstate commerce. Uh, it undermines public confidence in the integrity of the sport. Uh, we, need, we can do a better job promoting safety with uniform standards and what we're particularly interested in is uniform standards with respect to medication because that's where we've seen a lot of this, um, uh, this inconsistency. And the fact of the matter is over 50% of horses that were raced in 2014 were raced in more than one jurisdiction. So this is truly a national industry. It's an interstate industry. It implicates interstate commerce. And so uh, the, there, is a, there, is a, there is a possibility uh, of a new golden age of thoroughbred racing if we remove the impediments, the silos that divide the industry. Um, and so what this bill does, and I've worked with, uh, I'm the, the chairman of the Congressional Horse Caucus. I'm working with my co-chairman, a Democrat from uh, New York who represents Saratoga Springs, where a lot of our constituents um, uh, visit in August. Uh, uh, Paul Tonko and I have introduced this bill, the Thoroughbred Horse Racing Integrity Act. Uh, this legislation would create an independent, uh, non-governmental, thoroughbred horse racing uh, anti-doping uh, authority uh, which would uh, marry independence with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, which does a lot of Olympic sports uh, drug testing, uh, and also um, representatives from the, the thoroughbred industry. So input from constituencies within the thoroughbred industry, diverse constituencies within that industry, uh, to inform uh, that authority to create a national uniform medication program in terms of the rules, in terms of testing, investigation procedures, and penalties. Congressman, you, you know, you're speaking of medications. Are we talking about performance enhancing drugs? Is that yeah, the main yeah, thing? Right. And, yeah. and we don't think Congress should micromanage it. We think uh, this should be a, a non governmental independent body with expertise. Uh, that comes up with the uniform rules of racing. That's why we want independence and we also want input from the thoroughbred industry about what those rules should be, what the so, permitted substances should be and what the prohibited substance, substances should be, what the rules on race day should be, what the penalty should be, mm -hmm. but certainly we need something better and the industry deserves something better than a patchwork of inconsistent so and conflicting rules. You're saying that a horse may right now come in from New York and race in Kentucky and it may have been under a different set of standards in New York. That's exactly right and, it, and, and that impairs interstate commerce and it also, uh, it also undermines the international competitiveness of the American thoroughbred industry. A lot of jurisdictions outside of the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Hong Kong, Australia, uh, they have moved to a more uniform system, and we need to uh, we need to harmonize what we do in the United States, uh, so that our our blood stock, our sales at Keeneland and Phasic Tipton are competitive uh, with uh, international sales of blood stock, and also that our racing uh, has uh, meets the highest standards of integrity, and that uh, and so that the betting public, the wagering public, and uh, those who purchase uh, a breeding stock, mm -hmm. that they have confidence. Uh, that we have the highest quality uh, right. in the world. There are only a handful of uh, states involved in horse racing. How do you get these other states, the, the members of Congress from other states, to, to be interested in this topic? Well, you know, that's interesting because uh, as, a, as the chairman of the Congressional Horse Caucus, I've, I've done a lot of work talking to my colleagues and educating my colleagues about the economic impact that this industry has nationwide, $25 billion in annual economic impact, nearly 400,000 jobs. Those are direct jobs connected to the horse industry. And when I was building uh, the Congressional Horse Caucus and the roster, when I became the chairman, uh, I got a list from my staff of all of the members of Congress from around the country that had thoroughbred racetracks in their districts, and, and it's, it's, it, there's a lot of them. And I would you know, inform uh, my colleague from Chicago, hey, do you know you have Arlington in your district? This is important. This is a Churchill Downs uh, 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 racetrack. And, and uh, I've become friends with a lot of members of Congress, a lot of Democrats uh, across the aisle that I, that I wouldn't have otherwise uh, become friends with as a result of this endeavor. For example, Greg Meeks, who I serve with on the Financial Services Committee, he and I uh, disagree on a lot of issues relating to financial services, but he and I have become allies in promoting the thoroughbred industry. He represents Aqueduct and Belmont Park. So when we celebrate American Pharaoh, who won the Kentucky Derby right down the road, won the Triple Crown in, in Greg's district. So 
uh, we have a lot to work on uh, together, and we, we, uh, we think that we can really usher in a new golden era of thoroughbred racing that will benefit all of the country. You have to find the, the commonality. All right, on that Financial uh, Services Committee, you are working on some legislation uh, that would affect uh, community banks and lending and so forth. Uh, obviously, the pushback is that, well, it hasn't been that long ago that we had some real issues uh, with banking in, uh, in 2008. Uh, so uh, what are you trying to move forward? Well, the, the real tragedy about the Dodd-Frank law, which was the principal congressional response to the financial crisis is that it doesn't address the underlying causes of the financial crisis. What it does do, though, is impose a mountain of regulations on community financial institutions that really had nothing to do with the financial crisis. So uh, community financial institutions in central and eastern Kentucky, for example, community banks, credit unions, who didn't cause the subprime melt meltdown, uh, they are now dealing with an avalanche of red tape, uh, an avalanche of compliance costs uh, that frankly is uh, worsening the problem of too big to fail. We had about 7,600 community banks uh, or uh, federally insured depository institutions in this country um, in 2010 when the Dodd-Frank law was passed. Today that number is down below 6,500. What that means is that because of the compliance costs that the Dodd-Frank law has imposed on these community banks, uh, there, you, we've seen a lot of concentration uh, in the industry. So fewer, uh, fewer community banks, bigger banks are getting bigger. The too big to fail problem is worse today as a result of the Dodd-Frank law. A and consumers uh, have fewer options in terms of services and products because of these new costs. All right, so what is it you want to do? So one of the uh, regulatory, initiative, regulatory relief initiatives that, that I, I have uh, uh, promoted is a bill called the Portfolio Lending and Mortgage Access Act. This is a key priority uh, of both the credit unions in Kentucky and the Kentucky Bankers Association, the community banks that, that are the lifeblood of the local economy in central and eastern Kentucky. Um, this would restore relationship banking. Um, meaning that a community banker knows his or her customer and has a relationship built on trust, built on creditworthiness, um, and that's what we want to restore with this. The idea is that instead of uh, allowing the practices that caused the financial crisis, this originate to distribute model where uh, a mortgage originator originates a mortgage and then sells it off, maybe a subprime mortgage, into the secondary market, either to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or up into Wall Street. What we say is, let's provide regulatory relief by allowing a community bank to retain the risk to, to so-called portfolio that loan, and that would incentivize the bank to make sure it's a properly underwritten loan. All right. A and we encourage some regulatory relief. Do you want to go back to the days when somebody says, uh, put some money in Andy Barr's account, he's, he'll be good for it? Absolutely, we don't go back to those days. <laughs> uh, th that, that is not at all what we want to do. What we're talking about here is, and by the way, uh, the, the level of supervision and regulatory scrutiny uh, right now is much greater than it was yeah. pre-crisis. And so, um, uh, look, uh, failure happens in the, in the financial uh, world. And it's, it's not a problem if it's a community bank because it's not a systemically important bank. What we're worried about is concentration of risk, too big to fail banks, these mega banks that are systemically important. And if they fail because they're interconnected with our entire economy, that becomes a problem. But regulatory relief for small, non-systemically important community banks in central and eastern Kentucky in rural places, that means more credit availability. That means more deployment of capital into our communities in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, home ownership, in terms of small business, in terms of entrepreneurship. That is what will get our economy going again. That's what we're trying to promote. And actually, we're trying to stop some of the risky practices that caused the financial crisis, the kind of origination to distribute model yeah. uh, that led to some of the, the problems in the run-up to the crisis. Congressman Andy Barr is our guest on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. A lot more questions. We'll talk about this Iran nuclear agreement that is arriving in Congress and a lot more. We're back in a moment. 
Welcome back now to Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT. We are visiting with Congressman Andy Barr, who spends those busy weeks in Washington and then comes home and uh, you try to enjoy some family time and uh, also visit with your constituents, right? It's always busy. Exactly. And, and uh, we have had a very busy uh, couple months in Washington. So we've been in Washington more than I would prefer. Uh, but on these weekends, uh, when I do get home, we get a chance to visit with our constituents and we try to make the most of those weekends. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that the federal health exchange is lawful. Uh, and even though Kentucky Governor Steve Beshear created uh, Kentucky's own exchange and expanded Medicaid to make more people eligible, uh, you've called for the Health Care Act's repeal. Does this ruling uh, change your thinking at all? It changes nothing. The fact that the Supreme Court uh, has twice upheld certain provisions of the Affordable Care Act um, and, and made a constitutional interpretation about its legality it has nothing to do with whether or not it's wise public policy or helpful or beneficial or making life easier for the American people. Uh, to the contrary, what our constituents tell us, um, as recently as yesterday when I was visiting with the Kentucky Hospital Association in my office in Washington, is that this law is making life much harder for people in central and eastern Kentucky. We all want more coverage. We all want uh, more of our fellow citizens to have access to insurance coverage uh, of some kind. Uh, but what we've learned with this Medicaid expansion in Kentucky is that access to coverage, access to Medicaid, or access to a waiting line is not access to health care. Uh, the Kentucky Hospital Association, very concerned about the impact of this law in rural hospitals. Uh, we discussed the fact that 8,000 of their employees have, have been laid off as a result of this law. Huge cuts to rural health care, rural hospitals, and an estimated, under the code, this Code Blue report, an estimated billion dollars in additional cost well, to health providers. What is happening providers. to them? Are they not able to collect uh, the, their, their bills from uh, Medicaid? Well, Medicaid under-reimburses the providers. Uh, this Medicaid expansion is, is good only to the extent that you, if you think that, well, just giving someone Medicaid, that gives them nominal coverage, that might be good. But the problem is Medicaid uh, hospitals get paid less than the cost of providing care under Medicaid. What that means is rationing. What that means is waiting lines. What that means is it hurts, hurts the providers and compromises true quality access to health care uh, for those patients. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, what we want to do is something better. We think that the American people deserve uh, more coverage, but we think they deserve quality coverage. And um, one of the legislative initiatives that I've been supportive of is not just repealing Obamacare, which I think we need to do still, but I think we need to replace Obamacare with, with good ideas that actually uh, would help lower cost. That's the one major failure of Obamacare is it didn't lower cost. In fact, we're seeing costs skyrocket. The labor market is impaired. People are, uh, employers are, are forcing their employees into part-time work because of Obamacare. The Congressional Budget Office says that two and a half million fewer full-time employees, uh, full-time workers in this country because of the law. Um, Lowering the cost of health care and increasing true access is what we want to do. I'm a co-sponsor of the American Health Care Reform Act and in part, been part of the, the task force uh, that is uh, proposing alternatives to Obamacare. And one of the key provisions of the Republican Study Committee's alternative to Obamacare is a bill that I introduced with Senator Barrasso, an orthopedic surgeon who works closely with Senator McConnell over in the Senate. And what this bill would do is provide sensible medical liability reform to prevent defensive medicine, to deal with the doctor shortage that we face in this country, to address the real access problem, and also the lower cost. Congressman, That's what we want do, to do. do you think there has been a realistic uh, avenue found to uh, get coverage for those half million Kentuckians now who have taken advantage of this uh, Medicaid expansion? Well, what we do know is that uh, the taxpayers of Kentucky are facing a big bill, especially when the federal role and the federal share of, of the Medicaid expansion uh, uh, contracts, and that's going to happen. And so what that means is hardworking taxpayers who struggle as, as it is to pay for health care bills for themselves and their families are now going to have to pay an additional $400 million a year uh, for this Medicaid expansion. I think it's a tragedy. Uh, that uh, we have expanded government uh, instead of expanding the economy of families in Kentucky to allow them to afford higher quality health care. That's the focus that we've got to have. We've got to make it more affordable 
uh, for hardworking families in Kentucky to access better health care coverage. House Republicans in Washington, we have a better idea than expanding government. Our idea is to provide uh, tax credits or a, a tax deduction for individuals and families uh, who currently cannot afford coverage so that they can go out and get the health care that they want, that they need, that's quality health care on a more affordable basis. On another Supreme Court ruling, the one that legalized same-sex marriage, you have indicated that Congress might now uh, try to pass some kind of legislation in reaction uh, to that. What uh, would you support uh, to that end? Well, we need, this, this whole debate should center around respect. Respect for everybody involved. And, and if we're truly committed to respecting our fellow human being, uh, and if we're truly committed to, to not discriminating against people, we need to have, we need to be respectful of people of faith in this country. We need to be respectful of faith based leaders. I have been inundated uh, with calls and concerns from my constituents concerned about the ramifications uh, that this decision might have on. on uh, compelling people of faith, compelling people of, of genuine good faith conscience uh, to do something in violation of their, the basic tenets of their beliefs. So I have co-sponsored legislation called the First Amendment Defense Act, uh, which would protect people of faith, that would protect religious leaders, uh, institutions and organizations uh, that, uh, that do believe uh, that marriage should be defined as a union between one man and one woman, and that would prevent the government from yanking uh, a tax-exempt status of uh, any in, any organization that 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 define marriage in a traditional way. Do you think these county clerks in Kentucky who are not issuing marriage licenses at this point uh, have the right to take that stance? Well, county clerks in my district, many of them Democrats, and and and, and county judge executives, many of them Democrats in my district, have called me expressing concern because. Uh, these are people of faith who 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 worry about the, the the ramifications that this has on on their job duties and and what they're what they're supposed to do in light of this decision. Um, obviously, uh, there are some leaders in the General Assembly who have stepped up to to try to deal and address uh, that issue. That is a state issue. Um, but at the end of the day, we do need to um, at both the federal level and the state level remember that this is a country built on religious freedom, and we need to protect. Uh, that very uh, sacrosanct uh, freedom of conscience in this country. Congressman Andy Barr is with us on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. Our remaining moments coming right up. Welcome back in to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers, and we're visiting with Congressman Andy Barr, Republican. He represents the 6th District in Kentucky. The Iran nuclear agreement will arrive in Congress for approval. The president says it buys time and hopes for a political change in Iran over time. Uh, do you have a position on the agreement already? Well, as a member of the Terrorism Financing Task Force, we have been um, uh, uh, engaged in uh, searching oversight over uh, these negotiations and, and, frankly, very, very concerned about this agreement. I, I have read key provisions of the joint action plan that uh, Secretary Kerry has negotiated and that the President has announced. And, um, you know, what's, what's really concerning to me is that this agreement converts Iran, which is, we know, the world's number one state sponsor of terrorism, um, from a country with an illicit nuclear program into a, a, a country that is the world's number one state sponsor of terrorism uh, with a internationally sanctioned nuclear program awash in billions of dollars of sanctions relief. It's estimated that this agreement could lead to up to $150 billion in sanctions relief. And even if Iran complies with this agreement, we know three things are going to happen. Number one, uh, they are going to have a nuclear program that's legally sanctioned by the international community. The agreement permits Iran to retain a vast enriching program, enrichment program. Uh, it allows them to pr pursue nuclear R&D. It allows them to continue uh, to uh, invest in intercontinental ballistic missile technology uh, over time. And at the end of the process, they will be left with an, a nuclear program on an, inter on, a, on an industrial scale after 10 years. Secondly, secondly, it gives all of this sanctions relief to the Iranian government, which means According to the witnesses in front of my terrorism financing task force, the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, uh, Assad, all of these uh, rogue uh, terrorist organizations are now going to be uh, funneled and funded uh, a lot of this uh, sanctions relief, so they're going to be more well financed. And, um, and, and, and finally, what I'm concerned about is the key weakness 
the key weakness of uh, this agreement is that uh, even if we, even if you assumed that they would change their ways and after after decades of delay and after decades of, of, of deceiving international inspectors and I'm not talking about American inspectors I'm talking about United Nations inspectors the key weakness of this agreement is that even though the president throughout these negotiations said anytime anywhere inspections now they call it managed access and so the only way that inspectors can come in and look at these uh, sites is, is through a bureaucratic process that gives Iran a veto over the access to inspections. All right, sounds like you're a no vote on that. Uh, well, uh, absolutely, very concerned, <laughs> and we're going to be working very hard to block this bad deal that makes the American people less safe. You agreed with the president on trade. You voted for a trade promotion authority. So there's finally a place where Congressman Barr and President Obama agreed. Well, something. it is, but it's also about keeping this administration accountable. Um, you know, 96% of customers, 96% uh, of, of the world's uh, consumers live outside of the United States. Um, we know that free trade is important to hold other countries accountable for unfair trade practices, to open up um, these uh, countries, particularly on the Pacific Rim, to Kentucky-made products, whether it's the Toyota Camry or our, dis our bourbon distillery uh, industry or agriculture or our coal industry. This is a way to tear down those trade barriers and get Kentucky products into those, into those markets, and it's about transparency. I only wish that we had a TPA for the Iran agreement because Congress ultimately retains the, the ability to block this deal if it's a bad deal for the United States and the, and the American workers. We don't think it will be. We think it helps American workers. Do you support the Republican nominee for Governor Matt Bevan? Absolutely. Very strongly supportive of what he's trying to do. And uh, we're uh, introduce, helping him introduce him to some of the folks in the 6th Congressional District. Uh, it's critically important that we have a governor in this state that believes in uh, health care reform that puts the patient at the center, also making Kentucky more competitive than it's been. Uh, Matt Bevan has the right uh, answer for this state. Congressman Andy Barr, thanks for visiting Thank with you us. Very we much. appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT. I'll see you bright and early on WKYT this morning, starting at 4.30 this week, and we hope you have a good week ahead.